Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Underserve, the podcast for the rest of the tech industry. I'm your host, Andrew Jelina. With me in studio today is Bill Scott, an IoT software architect from Dover Corporation. Bill, welcome to the show. Thanks, Andrew. It's nice to see people in person. Yeah, it really is. So tell me, what got you interested in software and coding and hardware way back in the day? Yeah, so I've been doing this a while. Once you hit 50, you realize you've been doing this a long time. <laughs> I sort of fell into it. I went to Blackstone Valley Tech, which around here in Boston is a technical school. And we had the first software electronics concentration program. So half the time was programming, half the time was electronics. So they taught us how to feed tape into a mini computer. And they had an AS400 and we learned basic and stuff like that. And then the other program was electronics. So we learned how to solder and create boards and flashing, happy faces, stuff like that. And then I left after a year because I sort of believed the idea that you had to go to college if you wanted to go somewhere in life. So little did I know, <laughs> I left and I go back to the regular school. And then I went to UMass Amherst and almost everybody that was in Valley Tech with her in my engineering classes, you know. So you don't always have to believe those ideas that, you know, I think tech schools really get a bad rap. I think they're underrated. Really underrated. Especially when you pay a plumber now over a hundred bucks an hour and like, wait a minute. But they're essential. It's just the world sort of gives tech or the trades really a bad name. Everyone's essential, you know? So then you didn't really love UMass and ended up leaving for the Air Force, right? Yeah. It's not that I didn't love UMass. I think I loved it a little too much. <laughs> So academic suspension, I joined the Air Force after bouncing around construction jobs. And so I joined the Air Force, spent a couple of years in active duty. I get out and I go back to UMass and washed out again. And I joined the Army Guard. It was right around Desert Shield. So I joined the Army Guard just in case it got bigger and I'd get deployed. But we never got deployed. I lived around Worcester. So went to like Quinsig and Clark and took classes here and there while um, having trade jobs or here in their jobs. And I grew up kind of lower middle class. So my mother was just like, get a job at a warehouse or you need to start a career in a warehouse or, you know, she worked at Prime Computer. So I worked there for a little while assembling boards and stuff, but it was a tough job. <laughs> I was telling you the story, how I got into computers. I took a meditation class while I was bouncing around Worcester. And the meditation class turned into a group that we would all meet. And it turned out to be a bigger group. Right. And there was a, there was a guru and we would go visit the guru every month in, in New York. They would encourage us to learn programming and join the software consulting industry and basically use programming as another tool for meditation. That was a thing. As you become a good meditator, you become a better programmer because you can have bigger thoughts in your heads and increase your RAM or your compute power in your brain. Or your stack size. Yeah, your stack size. Yeah, that's perfect. And it's really true, even to this day. Anybody that meditates or plays music or can assemble big, complex things in their brain makes them a more competent programmer, I think. So where they, like, encourage you to get these good programming jobs and then tithe back to the group? Oh, yeah. So it was really organized. And we were the second generation of the group, right? So it must have been about 500 members of this. Wow. It was right around the time of Waco. Remember Waco, Texas and Koresh, you know? Yeah. So the government was on the lookout for cults. So they labeled our group a cult. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So then what happened? So they encouraged us to sort of live together as group members. And so I moved in with a bunch of friends in Boston. And I went to the Computer Learning Center, which is a sort of trade school for learning programming at the time. I think it's out of business now. But again, you go back to trade training. So I go to this computer training school, do some volunteer work after that, and then I land a great job at a foreign currency trader mutual fund. And then I bounce around some financials, and then the whole group moves to New York. So we get gigs in New York and stuff like that. And then every month we have meetings with the guru, and it's really an interesting time. <laughs> so what does the guru say during these meetings? It was more like a meditation. We would do this huge group meditation of like two or 300 people, or we'd have classes, or we would have a party, like a rave party, where everyone's dancing and stuff. 
It was great. Best time. It was the best twenties, you know. But eventually you're required to sort of give over your pay, you know. We helped you get these jobs, so now you gotta give us ten percent of your pay or it's all volunteer, but some people were given like ten grand a month just as a gift back to the guru, you know. Does he have like seventy two gold Rolls Royces? Or? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He had everything gold and everything Mercedes and he was a pretty cool dude. And they made music and there was groups that made music. There were groups that made art, but everyone made software and everyone meditated. So we would meditate an hour in the morning and an hour at night. And it was really interesting, a really interesting time. But supposedly there were people that worked at Microsoft, people that worked at Oracle, really influential companies that were in high positions. And in general, just having the peer support when you're going through interviews or need technical support or somebody to just listen to. That was the best part of the cult. But it was a cult because, I mean, it wasn't a cult because we were there on our own, you know. But a lot of families had sent intervention teams to New York. Like two kids were kidnapped back from their families and gone through one of those re-education camp. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it was really a funny time. So what made you finally say, all right, I think I'm going to move on from this? Yeah, I don't know. Something sort of clicked and I was just like, all right, I kind of miss my family and miss my life. So I was just like, I'm kind of (laughs) done. So I came back to Boston and did the same thing. Just grabbed uh, software consulting gigs, just ran the consulting world in Boston and went back to New York and Connecticut. But when I got out, it was really the start of the year 2000 wave of work, you know, so there was no end to the amount of work in Boston. And that changed into the startup world, the amount of money that was going into startups from guys that were writing ideas on napkins was incredible. (laughs) So I latched onto a couple companies that were servicing that industry through some investment companies. So my work was in helping build some of those companies. Any interesting stories from the stuff you built or stuff you saw then? Actually, it's funny. Mothernature.com, the first bellwether that showed a bubble. A bubble was about to burst, right? (laughs) The guy that started that was a finance guy, right? And he just had this idea on a napkin. And he ended up getting like $75 million. Wow. Just in the first and second rounds. And there was so much money being thrown around, right? So the company I was working for, the company was 10 people at the time. And so he sat with one of the directors and they had an idea for an e-commerce project. So they read us in on the project. We get the specs. We go off. Two months later, we come back. We have this e-commerce project and we're going to fold it into their system. By that time, it's gone from 10 to 25 people. And they're like, who are you? And so we explain who we are, show them the software. Like, great, this is great. And they give us another project. And it's a five-month, six-month project. So we go away and come back three or four months later. The company's gone from 24 people to 120 people, right? And the person that hired us is gone. (laughs) They didn't even know what they paid for, you know? So we give it to them and it's like this nutrition planner, you know, you fill out a questionnaire and then we would provide the packet of vitamins and minerals that you need. And we would send that order to a factory and they would build it in this consumable packages, you know? And so they're like, what is this project? We have no idea what this project is. And then eventually they took it and folded it in. But I think at that time they were starting to feel the stress of having so much money and not having any return yet. And then there was a rumor, I think my boss said, we could potentially get shares instead of money. (laughs) Right? And at the time, like Yahoo and AOL, they would open at 12 and then they would close that day at 112, right? And we're like, maybe we should take half in shares. And it turned out their opening bid was 42 and they closed the day at 12 or something. Oh. Something bad. So they were like the first startup to sort of go down. I heard a quote once someone was talking about whether or not they would accept equity or compensation while they were consulting for startups. And he says, unless I can spend warrants at Star Market, (laughs) I don't want them. I forgot to ask at the end of your story there, what was the name of the group that you were part of? 
The one with the guru. You know, because they were running from this cult awareness network. They're called CAN, right? And they would come to every one of our meetings and they would try to spread literature of, you know, you're trapped in a cult. Yeah. All that stuff. So they kept changing the name of the group. <laughs> <laughs> just name it asterisk, like yeah, a wild yeah. card. <laughs> yeah. It was basically the guy's name was Rama. So we were just the Rama group. But I think they were calling it like intergalactic network or something like that. But at the end, before I left, we would meet on the weekends because we were all programmers. It's three years in. We're all really skilled programmers. And we would meet in a hotel room. We would get adjoining rooms, clear out all the furniture, and just start coding. And we would meet in the morning, like on a Friday morning, talk about an idea. And we would just, 10 of us be in a room. We'd buy monitors and computers and we'd just bang out code. And by Sunday night, we would have a working proof of concept for a business and somebody would take that business and run with it. And we had no idea where it went. So. Wow. So you guys were like the original hackathon. Yeah. Yeah. Would you return the computers at the end of the weekend? <laughs> yeah. Return it back to Best Buy <laughs> yeah. or uh, whatever it was. 15% restocking fee. All right. Yeah, we'll consider thanks. that the rental price. <laughs> So I think I remember you saying that when you were doing a bunch of VB development and business apps and you did a lot of travel, not just the Northeast, but worldwide, where else did you go? Yeah. So in 95, the World Wide Web Consortium, they were asking for volunteers. So you had to write a essay and I got picked. So I got to travel to Paris and work at the fifth meeting of the consortium. And they were voting and discussing HTML4 format. So I got to meet Tim Berners-Lee was there and all these highly visible names. And I was really my first time out of the country. And I was just a punk kid. We just basically party all night and then all day just set up computers and set up AV equipment and stuff. There's a bunch of models there, French models. I didn't speak eighth grade French, you know. <laughs> so I'm just trying to get their attention, act like a clown. One day, these executives are walking in, they're checking in, and I was like, bonjour. <laughs> and this guy turns to me and goes, really, really angry. He goes, do not try to speak my language. It hurts my ears. <laughs> I said, Whoa, sorry, buddy. Now, I think you had a story about being involved with nightwire.com as well. Yeah, so when I got back to Boston, roommate with all my friends from college and high school and Basically, we started a company because maybe it was my experience with the group who just had this strong desire to create a company. And like everybody else did too, around that time in the 90s, you know, it's like nothing's been done yet. We can do anything because we're programmers and we build universes and full of hubris, you know? So I think it's kind of still true now because our jobs are basically to learn a business and then to improve the business. And I think it fills us as programmers in the sense of hubris and thinking that we can learn this stuff really easy. You got to go from one company to the next and learn their business really well and then help them improve it. So a lot of times like business advisors, especially if you're in the same industry a lot, like insurance was big and financials was big when I was younger. But anyways, myself and a couple computer friends, we decided we want to build things. We want to build products. We're going to use consulting as a way to fund it. So we're going to consult during the day and make our money. And then we're going to pool our time and build stuff at night and on the weekends, right? And it sounds great. So we would place people in jobs and we would get contracts through companies like Serence. And then at the end of the day, everyone would be working on an idea. So Nightwire was our first idea. Basically, we're sitting at a bar, we're saying, all right, we're at Whiskey's on Boylston Street. And we're like, all right, let's go play pool. Where can we play pool? There was only two places with a pool table that we knew of. And we all had Palm Pilots and we're like, why can't we just ask the Palm Pilot where we can play pool or where we could see a ska band or where we could whatever. So we came up with this elaborate idea of a guide of where to go and what features are at. And then eventually we moved to, let's have an ambassador. Let's hire some college kids to basically tell their route of where they go and what the best places to go. and where they're going today. So, you know, especially sitting at a bar, you have these big ideas. And we followed it up though. Like we got bars, they would agree to pay 30 bucks a month and we would host it and everything. The web was still really new and you were either AOL or you paid Comcast some ridiculous fee for a 28K modem mm -hmm. or you had your flip phone and texting. 
So we end up creating a JavaScript-based interface to a web page that's hosted in a CGI, and it worked great. We were about 90% there, and then we started fighting about who did more work. <laughs> and then finally we're like, screw you, and we just let the whole thing sort of die on the vine. A few months later, they came out with Sidewalk, which was sort of a metro guide. So we're like, oh, it's over now. There's some stuff that exists today, but there's still not a great... I want to go out and do X in Boston. I end up searching through the Globe's website to see what's going on this weekend or something like that. Yeah, I think there's still opportunities for good ideas. But if they're not getting done, it's probably because there's not enough money to sort of sustain it. So your comment there about, you know, we all started fighting about who was doing more work or not pulling their weight. My friend Ted has a quote. He says, most partnerships go sideways because someone feels like they're putting in more than the other folks, whether it's money or effort or whatever. Yeah, it's so true. But also back then, it's a little different than now, right? There are so many resources for anybody with an idea. You go to Cambridge Innovation Center, they have that thing in Cambridge. You can meet with a coach. I mean, they had SCORE back then. It's a government organization where you can meet with a business advisor and the it's usually like this retired executive that's going to help you with your taxes. And we already knew all that stuff. We really need somebody in the industry that could have guided us. But now there's so many resources for anybody with an idea. It's amazing. The new way of business right now is amazing. The idea of lean business strategies and lean coding where you're only building enough to prove the idea and you're only releasing enough to prove that it's a good idea. You need the business to validate any idea. So I think that really helps any entrepreneur right now. My dad told me never to talk to strangers or to recruiters or to strange recruiters. It's so exciting when the website gives zero information about the job I am applying for. You take one three-month sabbatical and all of a sudden you're unhirable. You're not allowed to say it, but you're looking for someone younger than me. Joke's on you. I'm 11 years old. Finding your next consulting gig should not be this difficult. Quite frankly, you deserve better. Syrinx is the consulting company founded and run by software consultants. We get you. Find out why our employees are some of the happiest and best paid consultants in the industry at Syrinx.com. That's S-Y-R-I-N-X.com. Find a better way today. Syrinx Consulting is a proud sponsor of Underserve, the podcast for the rest of the tech industry. Did you run into any good mentors along the way in your career? Well, I've had some really good managers. I've had some really good architect friends that definitely helped me along the way. I mean, one of the guys I'm working with now, he's the enterprise architect, and we've been working together for almost 25 years. You know, this industry is about people, and it's always good to keep the people that are nice and skilled and keep them around as much as you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another underserved guest, Jeremy Halperin, talked about a quadrant. Like, you want people who are nice and competent. If you're missing either of those, it makes it much harder to work together. Yeah, like you said, this industry of people, one of the hardest parts of this job is that we're all in some way on the Asperger scale. So we're naturally anti-human. <laughs> so to find that unicorn that's not only a good person and open and nice, but also competent and can code and understands complexity, and it's definitely hard to find. I think one of the things I found, and I always see this among our tribe, is like I said, we get this hubris and think we know the business and come up with an idea and we think we know everything because we're coders. We create worlds. From nothing. From nothing. You know, from a blank palette, we create an entire world. But like I tell everyone, ideas are like farts. Everyone loves their own brand, <laughs> but they all smell. They all have something that probably is not a good idea. Yeah, because you can. A lot of developers will develop and build something. And yeah, not getting that market validation you were talking about is definitely a theme we've talked about a few times on Underserved. Yeah, but that's the beauty of how the industry has really evolved and the whole idea of lean and the whole idea of 
some of the principles around transformation, you know, the new buzzword transformation. Yep. Now you're doing IoT work. How did you get into IoT? Well, I always saw this sort of like next evolution of software and combining software and hardware. Like right now is my favorite job because I'm building things that my friends and family can actually see and touch and feel. It was a great feeling to be able to share MotherNature.com, you know, and say, go to Mother Nature. I was part of that or whatever. Or I built an e-commerce site for Olympus, you know, and so go to Olympus.com and see it. But just seeing it in action or any of the startups we created, you know, go there and test it out and then it'll break and they'll be like, this thing's stuff. You know? <laughs> my friends and family were always my beta testers. So. But now you can see this thing in action and you can hold it and touch it. My first project a few years ago was we built a prototype for Crohn's disease patients. So this guy had a patent to identify early onset of uh, Crohn's disease flare-up. So we had these consumable cartridges. And so what we did, we created a little machine that they'd put the cartridge in, we'd take a picture of it, send the picture to the cloud, do some analysis, and then spit it out on their phone, whether they're at a high risk of a Crohn's flare-up. So I eat this thing, it goes through my system? And... <laughs> no, you had to poo on it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> so you had to take poo, mix it up, and then stick it on this little device and stick it in the machine, and then you had to clean it up too. So, yeah. IBS and Crohn's is an awful disease, but the idea of this was that they could mitigate the pain and suffering of the flare-ups by taking some medicine that will help the pain during the flare-up. The idea of having this box that I could show somebody and say, look at this, this helps people. This is really fantastic. So it worked? It was a prototype and it actually evolved into just the mobile app. So we didn't need the device anymore. We just refactored the card and then we just created some software to take a picture and did exactly what the device did. Yeah, cool. But again, it's like that lean, you start with a prototype, you refactor it and then say, do we even need this box? You mentioned prototyping. I know you've done some hacking on Raspberry Pis. What have you done with those? Well, that actually was a Raspberry Pi. Ah. So for the prototype, we used a Raspberry Pi. We were talking about this before. I think it's not just the Raspberry Pi. There's so many new boards coming out that are just as powerful. I have the Jetson board now mm -hmm. from NVIDIA, and it's the same size as the Pi, but it's specifically for running ML and capturing video and attaching to a camera. But yeah, having a Raspberry Pi has really changed the ability for an everyday person to create a device, an IoT device or any smart device that's connected to the internet and can run code. You know, my 13-year-old daughter can take a Pi and start writing code and it's amazing. Yeah, they are pretty powerful. I had some a long time ago and just fooled around with them and opened up a terminal and did a little C programming on it and turned the GPIOs on and off or whatever. Here at the office, we've been using them for video kiosks. We have episodes of Underserved playing on loop in the lobby and we have other photos and videos and stuff. And I noticed that the new Raspberry Pis, I want to say it's the A+, plus, just doesn't have the power to consistently spit out HDMI all day long. We had to change everything to B pluses in order to get that to work. Yeah. Did you have any hardware gremlins you had to chase down with it? Not really. But you know, the Pi gets such a bad rap because it's a hobby board. So we have a product that our partner has used the Pi and it's one of the main API gateways. Since we're only making two or 300 of these things, it's fine. It's not like we're mass producing them. You can spend it a couple extra bucks and just have a Pi rather than having to buy. Purpose built. Yeah, it's just a amount of chips, you know. Being in the medical industry a few years ago and seeing how they build <laughs> some of their equipment, they're just putting an off-the-shelf Windows 7 machine in these things. And without much engineering thought, at least the Raspberry Pi is small enough and cheap enough to change the industry. Yeah, and if you fry one, you're not that worried about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, if you did want to evolve something that you prototyped on a Pi to dedicated hardware, how do you do that? There's companies from Element 14 where you buy the Pi, you do a prototype. I think you can actually send the prototype to them and they will produce a schematic for you in a board and then you have to buy in volume and they'll do an SOC or they'll do a custom board for you. 
Do they like take out the pieces you don't need? Like if it doesn't need network or if it doesn't need HDMI, they kind of... Yeah, yeah, just take out the fat. Uh, okay. But again, then you kind of lose it. I've noticed a lot of times we'll have field operations and they'll say they have Ethernet, but they don't. So we have to switch over to Wi-Fi and they don't have Wi-Fi. And then how about Bluetooth or cell? Let's put a cell chip in. So we have the edge devices that we usually get in industrial scale are usually hardened, industrial hardened, they're secure, and they have all these options. You know, you can fail over to Ethernet or fail over Wi-Fi or cell if you need to. And then you always have a company to go back and complain to. You know, I guess one of the problems with having a pie is you have to buy all these components, put it together, put a housing together. Then if something fails. It's on you. <laughs> yeah. Welcome yeah. to open source. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nobody's picking up a phone in Shangju, China because their Bluetooth device doesn't work. You know? Yeah. Or because I'm getting error messages on my HDMI output. I get these little kernel panic messages that would start showing up on the HDMI in yeah. between the clips. I'm like, what? <laughs> I guess it's the curse of productivity of the open source world, right? Yep. Now, you wrote an article on Kafka as well, right? Yeah, my last job, I was a transformation consultant. So part of the job was to do a little bit of writing, a little bit of training, and then running these transformation squads at some insurance companies in Boston. I don't know if I should say their names, but... Yeah, we'll let them remain anonymous. Yeah, yeah. There's only two. <laughs> <laughs> they both did a big transformation project. So I would run these transformation squads. And first of all, it was a really young company. And they needed an old dude. <laughs> because the transformation teams were basically taking all these blue heads like me and trying to teach them how to learn the new full stack or react, basically learning lean. And it wasn't easy. <laughs> it's not easy for anybody, especially when you're in a job for a long time and you get into your rhythm and you know how to bang out code really quick in your own way and you can solve a problem. And now they're saying, I can't do that anymore. It's hard to take the productivity hit and the ego hit of now not being the master and having to go into this new technology and you're not comfortable with it, you're not as productive with it, and you're not the guru in it. Yeah, for sure. It's really hubris. <laughs> Maybe I'm using that word wrong. <laughs> but part of our transformation philosophy was it was more like XP. We were, we were teaching XP. And it's the human element about it. I thought it was really effective there because at a big role-based company, everyone gets their own fiefdom. Everyone gets their own sort of cube and I can have a problem and I'll go away in two weeks, I'll bring it back and it'll be solved and nobody else will know about it and it'll keep my job because I'm the only one that knows about it. We would have small XP squads and we would pair program all day. So somebody my age, I'm 50, pairing with a 22-year-old and they're really good at React, but this other guy knows the business inside and out, and they're both Asperger's. <laughs> so it was really interesting to see this boot camp, just seeing these guys, how they transformed from week one to week 10 was night and day. It was amazing. And then going through the one-week high-intensity sprints and all the ceremonies, and then XP is all about communication, you know, and pair programming is all about one person driving and one person reviewing at the same time and critiquing and just getting that technique down and trying to make sure that if you're not driving, you need to critique in facts and not in opinion. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And if you're driving, you have to take those facts on board and you have to agree on the professional terms, but then you get ego and you're like, I'm not changing that. You're an idiot. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I had to break up fights. It was funny. It was bad. <laughs> but by week 10? By week 10, everybody knew how to do it. It was smooth. Everybody wanted to pair a program, you know? Everyone wanted to write unit tests because every piece of code had to be unit tests, and, which you do it for training. In real practice, it's a little impractical, but the training part of getting used to the idea of writing a unit test or programming and communicating at the same time you're programming changes the way you program. Yeah, I've done some extreme programming, pair programming, and it's definitely all of the things you said. It's instructive, it's humbling, 
It's somewhat awkward. You got to figure out how to diplomatically sometimes get a little idea in there, depending on the person you're working with. It's often hard, too, to get management to buy in on it because they're like, wait, I'm paying two people to do the work of one. Well, no, actually, you're going to get more productivity, fewer bugs and better results and cross-pollinization of skill sets or just a little editor trick. Like, oh, if I hit command shift one, it does this. Like little things like that. Yeah, especially a big organization, you're investing in your farm team, you know, and that's really where executives have to understand that a boot camp like that really, really can organically improve the quality of their team just in their personal ability to communicate with each other. It pays a ton of dividends. Not all of them easily quantifiable, but everyone has a little bit easier time after that getting stuff done. Yeah. But again, like I was a transformation consultant, right? So it's really just a glorified, we're just the bobs, you know? <laughs> so everyone knows you're just looking for heads to cut off and stick on a pike. <laughs> We've got a printer here we could smash later if you want. <laughs> PC load letter. Yeah. <laughs> so what have you been doing interesting in IoT? I know you were doing some image recognition stuff. Yeah, so this a Dover where I'm at now is pretty much my culmination of my entire life, my professional life. So I've always sort of wanted to be an architect, be that guy. So I always looked for contracts that would sort of fill in areas that I didn't know. So I would take regular enterprise programming jobs, and then I would move to shrink wrap software, and then I moved to web and tried to get experience in all phases of software. I took a field service job for a while, and so I was deploying code to customers, which is interesting. But seeing the end result of a development team in practice was really hard to do. I'm implementing this code that if I had the source, I could probably fix and make a lot better. <laughs> the team was in Germany and I'd call them up like, guys, Jesus, you test this stuff. <laughs> you know? So being in front of the customer or a board of executives trying to explain why something doesn't work or it doesn't work the way it was advertised or whatever was really interesting. So now I run multiple projects at the same time. I'll tell you a little about Dover. Dover is an $8 billion company. And they made their money. They probably had never heard of them. But every time you pump gas, there's Dover on the hose. So they made their money in the 20s. They had all these patents to pump gas, to pump fuel. And it just collected money off their patents until the 80s. Then they started purchasing vertical market, expanding into different markets. And I guess in 2000, they really exploded. And now they have about 40 different brands in five different lines of business. But most of the businesses are, let's say, slow to change, like gas stations and anything in petrol that's downstream is usually pretty resistant to technology, like hauling gas and stuff. And we have environmental, so garbage trucks. We have sensors on cameras on garbage trucks that identify whether a dumpster is overfull. As soon as it discovers it's overfull, customer gets charged 25 bucks. Ah. Guy doesn't even have to get out of the truck. He gets... 25 bucks. Takes a picture, sends a bill, bang. Doesn't even have to send a picture. It's automatic because uh, it's video. And the AI will just identify whether it's over full just by the pattern recognition. What if the customer pushes back? Like, was it over full? We, yeah. like, we, we have video. video. Yeah. yeah. In fact, I think they get the picture in the bill. So it's those things where, you know, a garbage truck company doesn't really know about software. So we can introduce products like that to sort of help them, number one, realize more money and reduce waste and stuff like that. So part of my job is I work for the digital leadership division where we live transformation. It's not just a buzzword anymore for me. It's kind of what we do. So we lead any software projects or try to help train or educate our companies how to use new technology, use IoT, use web to help them make money basically yeah it sounds like you're selling a solution to a garbage hauling company not like hey you want some software and hardware you're like hey you want to make more money every time there's an overfull dumpster yes sign me up yeah the cto of the division that i'm in is brilliant he's just one of those visionaries that he's already sold the company 10 years ago and he's in this role that he's trying to help the company really realize value by using technology correctly so they've identified a lot of these projects that'll have a high impact as long as we get market validation. So it's really satisfying to be able to improve the business with just 
implementing software, you know. Making something from nothing. That's it. That's it. <laughs> so, Bill, thank you very much for coming down today and being a part of Underserved. Thanks, Andrew. This has been real fun. Can't wait to listen to more. Yep. We'll have your episode ready soon, and we'll talk to all of you next time on the next episode of Underserved.